Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the executive director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're a voice of conscience for peace, justice, human rights, and intercultural encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine Israel Network of the United Church of Christ, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice Coalition, and ICAD USA. We're delighted to be hosting this conversation with our friend Mark Braverman uh, of Kairos USA. And it's uh, Kairos USA is one of the co hosts of our uh, interview today. You all know and respect Mark Braverman, Executive Director of Kairos USA, a member of the Global Kairos for Justice, and Research Fellow in Systematic Theology and Ecclesiology at Stellenbosch University. Mark has also consulted with many Christian denominations on the role of Christian-Jewish relations in the discourse on Israel and Palestine. Today, and, and we hope you had a chance to read it, we're particularly focusing on Mark's recent essay, Theology in the Shadow of the Holocaust, Revisiting Bonhoeffer and the Jews. So, Mark, it's a real pleasure to have this conversation with you today. Welcome. You want to unmute yourself, Mark. Thanks, Mike, and thanks so much for uh, for holding this interview. You know, you and I have been, uh, you, you've been my treasured friend and colleague for many years in this work, and we've had a lot of spirited conversations, so it feels like this is going to be one more, except we've got a lot of company this time. <laughs> well, we're happy to do this, and we're happy to have uh, many of your friends and mine, too, uh, on the call with us. So let's get right to it, Mark. Uh, why Bonhoeffer? Why, why does he remain such a compelling figure in Christian theology, but particularly for your work? Yeah, I was just thinking about that. Um, this paper is is about Bonhoeffer, but really uh, it's a springboard for, for so much more. Uh, it took me about three years to write the thing. I, I felt like I had so much to say. And in the very beginning of the paper, I have a brief paragraph sort of introducing myself uh, so that uh, readers, hopefully many who don't know me, um, would understand where I was coming from. I needed to make it clear that I was Jewish. And um, I talked about uh, what brought me to these issues, which um, you all know about, uh, that it was my encounter with the, with the Palestinians and, and, with, and with what Israel has become, as opposed to what I was taught it was supposed to be and what it was supposed to mean. And I said that, I, what did I say? I say, you know, I, I went to Palestine to meet my purported enemy um, and had my heart broken, but also my heart opened um, and began to take a look at what it was that had happened to my, to my people. Um, translating that into Bonhoeffer's terms, what had happened to my nation and also what had happened to my church, right? To the synagogue, to the Jewish institutions. And I think what I wrote there was, uh, once having um, had that experience, and started to interact a lot with churches and Christians as a result, it was only a matter of time until I encountered Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And um, when I did, and I continue to encounter him every day because there is so much to unpack about him, um, it, just, it just opened my mind and it opened my heart. So I feel very close to him, to his experience, to the journey that he, that he went through. Um, and then the other side of that is, which is really what the paper is, the topic of the paper is, what was uh, done to him and his legacy uh, in the context of post-Holocaust theology on the part of both Christians and, um, and Jews. Bonhoeffer tends to be a Rorschach test kind of for all kinds of people and all kinds of interests. Um, to me, um, what was done with and to Bonhoeffer as uh, with respect to the whole issue of the Jews um, and the Holocaust is an 
absolutely critical issue, not as a matter of theological or historical interest, um, but as a, a really urgent issue for what we're looking at today. You contrast Jewish and Christian post-Holocaust theology like this. For Jews, the fundamental question was, where was God? For Christians, it was, where were we? Tell us about it. Yeah, so I started to take a look at post-Holocaust theology. And again, th this is a case where, and you and I have talked about this, um, it has been the water we drink and the, the water we swim in and the air we breathe, especially with respect to, to, to theologians and clergy, both Jewish and Christian. Uh, something dramatic happened to both Jewish and Christian theology uh, in the aftermath of, of World War II and the, uh, and the genocide that happened there. Not only to the Jews, but this of course has been the central focus of all the, the millions and millions of people who died and suffered during that conflict. Um, so I felt like in order to get the paper going, I really needed to unpack that. What is post-Holocaust theology? Now it's a lot of things. Um, and again, I would make the point that it's what, what happened to Western theology, certainly after the war, but it's different for Jews than for Christians. So for Jews, the big, um, the crisis was um, really how, <laughs> Who is God if he could do this to us? I mean, we th I thought we were the chosen. I thought we were, and yes, we've suffered in the past, but this is a whole new, this is a whole new level. This looks like annihilation. Um, and Irving Greenberg and Emil Fackenheim and other prominent Jewish theologians have really taken that on. I never quite understood it growing up um, as a kid. And as a student studying these things, what does it mean to ask that question about, about God? What I found when I started to, to, to go back and read this stuff again, brought me back full circle to what I had discovered in my own journey um, confronting Zionism, which is this issue of what I called, and I think in the paper, brittle exceptionalism, that we are so special. So then the question becomes, well, if we're so special, this doesn't compute. How does this happen? And what, what the Jewish theologians and Jews in general did with this was to say, A, well, it was to say, this suffering, this is a message. This focuses and crystallizes our mission and our mission is not, as I was brought up, to bring light uh, to the Gentiles and to bring God's word to the world. Our mission is to take care of ourselves and to, and, and to go back to Palestine and re basically reestablish the, the temple state, the theocracy. I mean, that blew my mind, but this is what it is. And I documented in the paper, that's the thrust of Jewish post Holocaust theology. Let me uh, let me pick up on the Christian or uh, uh, finish well, up I, on I, the I Jews. About the Christians, but, but yeah. let me let me ask you the question, and then that'll give you an entree kind of into the Christian post Holocaust theology. Mark, yeah. um, as I mentioned to you, as a young minister in the late seventies, mid to late seventies, the heyday sort of a Jewish Christian uh, post Holocaust theology. Franklin tells the Christian, uh, the crucifixion of the Jews, Paul Van Buren, Christer Stendhal, who, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a Lutheran boy, I mean, he was uh, uh, all the rage, and others, yeah. uh, in, uh, they shaped Jewish-Christian dialogue. And regarding what they had to say, regarding Littell and what they said, you write this. You write that they, quote, demonstrate how post-Holocaust theology has succeeded in projecting onto the Jews a particular Christian brand of exceptionalism, in restoring particularity 
the particularity of the original covenant, Christian post-Holocaust theologians have granted the Jewish people permission to possess the land regardless of the consequences for the Palestinian population. And then here's the line. Christian post-Holocaust theology has produced a shared exceptionalism more antithetical to the Gospels than the doctrine it was meant to replace, and its language is Zionism. Man, I read that, and wow. So please, un unpack that for us. Yeah. There's a lot there. Yeah. So the, 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 the challenge, the crisis that was facing the, the, the Western Christian, uh, I'll go back to this white world, um, in the aftermath of, of, of the war, I mean, I, I sort of stated very dramatically, so standing before the stacked bodies in the ovens of, of, of the death camps was, there was, there was, it was an enormous challenge because quite appropriately and accurately, what the Christian world said was, we did this, you know, this is the culmination of, you know, close to 2,000 years of institutionalized uh, anti-Judaism and anti-Semitism. The, the church threw the Jews under the bus pretty early on, all kinds of reasons for that, but then it became, uh, it, it penetrated the Christian theology and Christian worldview and anti-Semitism really became part and parcel of what it meant to be the church. So the Christians have a, had a lot to, to answer for. Um, and to their credit, and I, I quote them in the paper, many of these theologians starting in Germany, but then quickly spreading throughout Europe and back into America said, in order to really get, get okay with ourselves, we've got to take a close look at what this whole anti-Judaism thing was about. But then um, they'd made an end run around the, to me, it was the obvious answer. It was about Christian exceptionalism. It was about the fact that we, Christians, are the most beloved of God. We've replaced the Jews in God's love, all of supersessionism, replacement theology, all of that. And, you know, we're waiting to bring the Jews along so that they can become part, you know, accept God's love as well, and, and on and on. You all, you all know that very well. But his Christian exceptionalism is what underlies the anti-Judaism. Broadening that out, racism in general is what underlies whiteness and all of Western civilization, which the church uh, you know, became, was very, very much a part of and supported that. So what we're, we're seeing now is that the church became a, a empire and, and colonial endeavor from the beginning. That's what brings it back to, the, to, to, to today. You know, but back to 1945 and post-war period, <laughs> Christians and the church, for the most part, were not willing to do that. They were not willing to take a look at the fact that the real problem with us and what has caused this and what it has caused the ills over the centuries and it's going to, what it is going to go on to cause all kinds of suffering and environmental and planetary destruction is the fact that it's us and them. We're better, we get to do what we need to do. So an end run around it and said, anti-Semitism is the problem. It is, in the, in the words of, it was either Littell or Gregory Baum, the Christian sin, the sin against the Jews. And so what we need to do is we need to say, we were wrong about all that, by the way, Jesus was wrong when he said destroy his temple, but never mind that. We'll, we'll deal with Jesus later. We'll leave him behind as we go about this project. And we will restore chosenness. We will restore the idea of one tribe, one people, beloved of God with a special mission to the Jews. It's not ours anymore. It's, it's about the Jews. And then we'll, that, in that way, we will cleanse ourselves of our sin and in the meantime, we're going to take a ride on that. We will piggyback on the Jewish exceptionalism and say that we are, and this is in the words of uh, one prominent, um, uh, I, th I think he was Methodist or Presbyterian, um, 
Christian theologian, um, Clark Williamson said, we are guests in the house of Israel. We are guests in the house of Israel. So Israel again becomes the core concept of what the church is and Zionism comes right along with that. We thought we were all very progressive because in, we, we replaced the replacement theology, which we thought was regressive, to now we are grafted into the covenant tree, you know? And so that was, we were honoring our interfaith partner, right. our Jewish sisters and brothers. But as you point out, it becomes a, a shared exceptionalism now. Exactly. And I think what I wrote was that it's more potent and more toxic than the original exceptionalism that it was meant to correct for. Absolutely. Well, let, let, that's really helpful, Mark. Let's, uh, let's return to Bonhoeffer now. C can you describe for us, I mean, you go into great detail, but can you describe for us the different understandings of Bonhoeffer vis-a-vis -vis the Jews uh, that you lay out in the paper? And what's at stake, really? Uh, in these different interpretations. Yeah, okay. Um, it, it, it runs the gamut. Right. Okay? I mean, there are, uh, continue to be uh, Jewish theologians in particular uh, who say, you know, Bonhoeffer was an anti-Semite. They go back to some of his writings. Uh, because, you know, he was a good bourgeois Lutheran, German Lutheran. <laughs> And they were very clear <laughs> about all of this. And, um, and his theology, the theology they articulated fairly on in his writings was the standard Lutheran line. Um, so, you know, they, they just cancel him out as far as, uh, which is a reaction to the, so, to the martyrology to the hag hagiography of Bonhoeffer, which was basically, to put it bluntly or quickly, he died for the Jews, right? The Germans right. killed him because he was one of those good Gentiles. And I was raised on this concept, you know, most Gentiles, like, watch out for them, you know. But there are some good ones. Why are they good? Because they helped save the Jews from Hitler, right? And Bonhoeffer was one of them. Now, many Lutherans in particular loved this, for obvious reasons, you know, because Lutherans carry around this huge burden of guilt, even maybe more than other Protestants and certainly Catholics, about, uh, about Germany and Hitler and what the German church did, which was the Lutheran church. Not to mention the Pope, but we'll just stay with the Protestants for now. In, in fact, Mark, excuse me, you, you even quote Eberhard Betke, uh, Bonhoeffer's friend, colleague, uh, biographer, my biography carries the burden of the Shoah. Right. I mean, this, I almost wrote this paper just about Betka because it's <laughs> just an amazing study uh, in, in this. So, yeah, so there's the burden of, of the Shoah. So, um, there was a big push. Betka was one of them, but we have many, 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 many. Um, uh, Protestant theologians who uh, really uh, push things really, really hard, uh, go way beyond Bonhoeffer uh, in trying to show that uh, his, he started off as a damn anti-Semite Lutheran, German Lutheran, but because of what he witnessed during the war, as part of his opposition to Nazism, he changed his whole view theologically about the Jews and devoted himself after that to, you know, to, to saving the Jews. He did no such thing. Um, the, um, you know, what I wrote, and I, ho I hoped it would be maybe the most provocative sentence in the in the paper, Bonhoeffer did not die for the Jews. He died for Germany. He died for his church. It wasn't about the Jews. Um, and uh, 
then I have some some sort of some some borderline or some 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 figures on the fence. Chiefly, um, a, a colleague from Bon Arbor Society, who wrote several books um, about this. I'm having a senior moment, and I'm, I'm, I'm blocking his name, maybe for other reasons as well. Um, <laughs> who basically um, wrote a whole book critiquing some of the same people I was critiquing this critiquing saying Betka and others really stretch things. You know, we have to take a look at this critically because you know there's more to this than simply making Bonhoeffer a martyr for the Jews. And uh, it distorts his, his, his legacy. But there's one thing that, that they don't do, which is to step back and say, why is there this preoccupation who's figuring out whether Bonhoeffer um, died for the Jews? And what was Bonhoeffer's, um, what do you really think about the Jews? Um, what do we make of this? Did he change his theology? Did he renounce his, his, his Lutheran background? Um, and I'm thinking, can we get off this? Can we stop talking about the Jews for once and think about what all of this means? And that has been, to me, the problem with mainline progressive Christianity that has stopped the church. That's ending now. I mean, we, over the last two years, I mean, we've made enormous you know, Now the, the, the UCC and the Presbyterians and right behind them in line are the Methodists and, and, the, uh, and the Episcopalians, not yet the Lutherans saying, hey, Israel's an apartheid state, you know? And in saying that, they have finally closed off the last escape hatch from being able to back off at all about doing what needs to be done about Israel as a church, as they did for South Africa. Okay? But the, the, the fact is that the, the, I went off on a tangent, I lost my train of thought. The, the, the preoccupation with Christian sins against the Jews has tied the church's hands behind its back. And the Bonhoeffer um, uh, literature, the studies of Bonhoeffer, the whole literature about him and the Jews uh, is an example of, of, of how that has happened. And if we really take a look at Bonhoeffer, we will see that he was way beyond thinking about that, that he was thinking very, very broadly. And near the end of his life, in the letters from, from prison, he makes the statement that we have to talk about a religion as Christianity. People have been trying to understand that for years, but I know what he was saying. He was saying, yes, in a way, religion has been the problem. And if we're really going to be with Jesus, we will go back and we'll, and we'll realize that Jesus was saying the same thing when he said, destroy this temple. He was talking to the church of his day, saying, you've thrown in with empire. You've left God behind. You've left Torah behind. Um, and you've left the prophets behind. And that's what's happened. So that's why, that's why looking at Bonhoeffer today uh, is important. But it really is just a springboard. Let me... Um... Let me give you one more chance to just reiterate kind of what you just said by quoting from your paper, Mark, and your thesis about Bonhoeffer. You write, we must believe that Bonhoeffer fully comprehended the horror and sin of the persecution of the Jews, but it was not the central issue for him. If we make Bonhoeffer over into a post-Holocaust theologian, we have lost Bonhoeffer, and we have lost the Jesus he devoted his life's work to bringing to us. Yeah. And that's the connection to post-Holocaust theology, which yeah. uh, I, I would say is just, it's, it's, it's one flavor or one iteration or one expression of post-World War II theology, um, which again, missed the opportunity for the church to have a, yet another reformation to really get to the bottom of what's been wrong because if you went there, if the church goes there, 
it will really have to refashion itself and as an institution and, and, as a, and as a belief system. That's what Jesus was after. You know, he, um, he, was a, he was a radical reformist. And he was saying there is something rotten in our theocracy and in what we have done with the Torah and with the legacy that, 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 that was given to us. And if we're really gonna reform this, we've got to take the whole thing down. That's that famous, that, that wonderful um, scene in, in John chapter two, where he stands, he turns up in Jerusalem, stands before the temple and says, destroy this temple and I will build it up in three days. And, and, and the, the apostles, of course, are standing there with him who were always his straight men say, well, master, how is that possible? They've been remodeling this thing for 46 years, more gold, more stones, more pomp, more circumstance. Uh, what do you mean? And then the narrator of John comes in to explain it to us like we're six years old. He was speaking of the temple of his body. So that's, you know, that's the, the, the classic um, sort of temple theology. Jesus, Jesus becomes the temple, which means that the temple is no more. And you have one united, one humanity, one humanity united in a new kingdom of love and, and, and compassion. You tease us, Mark, uh, uh, in one place, but it's a subtext and, and I'm just picking up on what you were just saying, with with Christians post Holocaust preoccupation with the Jews, it remains it, it minimizes the gospel into a gospel of particularity, when really Jesus' message is a gospel of universality. You don't quite say it that way, but you do use this particularity universality language as a subtext for your thesis. I think. It, it doesn't minimize it. It turns its back on the fundamentals of the gospel. Yeah. Um, that's why, you know, people sometimes ask me, when did I convert to Christianity, right? Because yeah. I'm a <laughs> Christian. And I learned to answer that question by saying, well, you know, I don't know what that would mean, but I wish that things had gone differently in the centuries after Jesus' crucifixion, because I wouldn't have to be answering that question, you know? So the Jews go back to their insularity, right? And to their separateness and specialness and circumcision and Sabbath and the dietary laws, all those things that Jesus said, and, and Paul said, no, 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 no more. Those weren't just rituals. Those are fundamental enactments of how we are supposed to be separate and special, right? So the Jews went back to that. There was rabbinic Judaism, they let go of the temple, but they always, partly the historical circumstances in the church helped along a lot with this, stayed within that sense of, of insularity and self-protectiveness. And we see where that results today. When we yeah. take the, Israel. the church, the Christians who were supposed to, establish, who, who were huddled in basements, you know, seditiously resisting the Roman empire ended up, we know the story there, throwing in and becoming the official religion of the empire and becoming an empire themselves and, and, and blessing the slave ships, you know, within, you know, within a thousand years. So that's, that's, the, that's the tragedy of our shared history. And it's coming back to us now in, in a global crisis uh, that, it can't you know can't be overestimated. It, it's uh, it's brought us to where we are today. I want to follow. I want to follow up on that. Uh, um, this this question about particularity uh, by uh, quoting one of one of the other things that you said. You're you're a clinical psychologist specializing in traumatic and post traumatic stress, and. Uh, um, this brief description that you give in your article, when, dis when discussing Christians' views of the Jews, this is what you write. Whether Christians see them as damned or blessed, the projection of either goodness or evil onto Jews has the same result. The failure to see the shadow of particularity, 
the shadow of particularity that has bedeviled Christian identity and plagued church history. Yeah. I, I don't know what else, what more, <laughs> what, what well, more. That's what you've been saying. I mean, that's what you've been describing. Shadow. Now, shadow is a Jungian term, right? It means the unacknowledged, the unacknowledged part or uh, of the self that because it's unacknowledged and stays unconscious basically drives you uh, because you, you, you're not conscious of the fact that there is this shadow self um, that, that needs to be understood so that you can make, you can, you can make real choices uh, and lead the life that you, you really want to lead. So the shadow of Christianity has been its particularity. And again, you know, now these days, and it's how old, is, how long have we been talking about this since Kendi and others wrote their book? Uh, it's whiteness, you know, and whiteness is not about the pigmentation of your skin. Whiteness is a worldview. Whiteness is all about, um, uh, is all about one, uh, those in power remaining in power and pursuing their imperial and colonial uh, aims. Um, and the church has been up to, you know, has been completely uh, interpenetrated with that. In every historical era, there have been Christians who have said no to that. And if they weren't burned at the stake, they certainly became marginalized. And that's the struggle within the church that we have to honor. You know, the South Africans really, um, well, Church struggle in the Christian comp was something that emerged from, again, we get back to Bonhoeffer, from the, the struggle within the German church uh, about the church having thrown in with, um, with national socialism. That was the church struggle. That was Bonhoeffer's struggle. Okay? The South Africans adopted that. Uh, when, the, when the South African churches adopted that when they began their anti-apartheid struggle with, you know, back in the 60s and said, this is our church struggle. And it's the only way for us to be the church is to struggle against this shadow, yeah. this dark side of accepting uh, God's grace through Jesus Christ, right? Because it absolutely turns... Jesus and the gift of God's love on its head and turns it into something so dark and so antithetical to the sense of the gospels that, so that struggle continues always. Now, and it's a struggle that's going on today. It's a struggle that's going on within the Jewish community um, as well. And it's Palestine that has that has, that has crystallized it and presented itself to us uh, today. Let me uh, let me follow up on what you just said, Mark. Uh, um, you say that the, the language of quote shared exceptionalism of Christian post Holocaust theology is Zionism. Then you write a powerful amalgam of political ideology and theology. Zionism is an example of what happens when nationalism and religion coalesce in the context of power, we have seen this before. Mm -hmm. And then you list examples, right? The colonization, enslavement, and extermination of indigenous peoples, South Africa, descendants of European settlers, dispossessing and enslaving indigenous Africans, the English Protestant foundation founders of the U.S., a colonial settler project, you call it, a malignant German nationalism between the wars. That was the context for Bonhoeffer. So, I mean, you, you, you kind of give a litany of the places where this coalescence, right, of uh, national, nationalism and uh, 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 religion result, uh, uh, ha have horrific results. Yeah, well, the list goes on. Um, and... I had forgotten to complete my thought, which was that Bonhoeffer, and I think it was Bart as well, in the, in, in, the, in the context of their struggle, asked the question, what is the church? What is the true church? Um, and uh, 
the, the story that goes with that was that in 1935, Bonhoeffer went to what would become the ecumenical movement. It was mostly student groups and young clergy in those days, mostly European and, and Americans. And they were meeting, I think in, 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 uh, in Scandinavia, in Fano, and uh, the question was, who, who gets to be in the tent? And what Bonhoeffer said was, you can't let the German Christians into the tent, the Deutsche Christen, which was really what the Lutheran church, the state church had, had declared itself to be. And what it meant was, we are the German Christians, which means that we embrace national socialism. And he said, you can't let them in. They're heretical. They're not good Christians. They're not Christians at all. It has to be our confessing church, those that have opposed that, that need to represent the German church in our ecumenical gathering. And uh, the, the decision was, no, sorry, we have to keep the tent open. We can't push out our German brothers um, because of ideological reasons. The, the ecumenical movement is an organization of churches and the most important thing is preserving the integrity of the organization and to keep peace. Yeah. Um, and what, what Bonhoeffer wrote at that point was, no, the true church is the confessing, living, struggling church. So those are three really, really important words. What does it mean to confess? To confess means to declare your discipleship to Jesus, right? And if you're really doing that, the way always has to be clear in any given situation about what's the right thing to do. Living, because that's the only way that the church is alive. It's constantly, and we get to the last word, struggling. There has to be conflict. There has to be dissension. You know, and of course, Jesus, two, two points in the gospel says, you know, you think I've come to bring peace? You want peace? No. It's about conflict. It's about dissension. It's about separation. It's about saying, it's about saying there are sides to this and you have to take a side. Yeah. Now I've forgotten your question. What was no, that, that, it's okay. It's about uh, um, uh, this this litany of uh, uh, different examples yeah, yeah. in history. Uh, yes, and that's that's the point there. I mean, the list could go on and on and on. It happens in every historical era. The church confronts history. If the church is only involved in keeping its own house standing and in looking backwards or in trying to keep things frozen, then it's dead. The church always confronts history. There are always different answers because its questions remain different. But we always come back to the same question asked and answered by Jesus, which is, who is my neighbor? If you take a look at that parable, the narrative is very, very clear. There's always going to be the poor, the naked man in the ditch. You don't have to look far. What's going to be your decision? And who are you going to be in that situation? You write this, Mark. And it, it kind of picks up on what you were saying just a few minutes ago. Uh, but I found it to be very powerful. And so I want to just quote it for the folks on the, on the call. What might have been the consequences for the Zionist project itself if theologians had taken a hammer to the gnarled kernel of Christian triumphalism rather than resorting to the comfort of a guilt offering? and with it the enabling of the Jews' sins of conquest and dispossession. What might have been the consequences for the Zionist project if that had happened? What's, what's the role of uh, uh, liberal guilt uh, in, in all this, liberal Christian guilt? Well, guilt is cheap, right? I mean, it's just cheap, and it's self-absorbed, and it's, and it's fairly useless because it keeps you it, it keeps you stuck. Um, shame is probably a more important word there. Um, what might have been the consequences? That's what's. That's what makes keeps people stuck in guilt. 
because <laughs> nobody wants to face those consequences. I see John, John Kleinhax over here in, in the chat says, how do Jews remain Jews if there's to be one humanity united in the kingdom of love, compassion? I mean, I would, you know, I would, I would say, how are Christians to remain Christians? And Bonhoeffer was, was, was asking that as well. How are Muslims to remain Muslims? So we all have our identities and our um, traditions and our cultures. And that diversity is a wonderful thing. But if we make it the thing, and if we make the, our identity and our affiliation um, and our label as Christian, Jews, Buddhist, secular, communist, capitalist, whatever, um, then we're, then, then we're, we're doomed. So um, again, the Holocaust was a, an opportunity to take a hard, to take a hammer to the hard kernel of Jewish, except, of, of Christian exceptionalism. Yeah. Um, for the Jews too, I mean, coming back to, to psychology, but again, I think it applies to Christians as well. Um, we saw, we experienced the, the most horrible, horrific example of suffering and, and, and threat of annihilation, which is what is the, defines post-traumatic stress, right? It's, it's, it's a reaction to that kind of experience. Now, what we learned in studying post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, first with the Vietnam War, and then with looking at, uh, at domestic violence and child abuse and, and such, is that the only way to recover, the, the real injury is the damage to the ability to love and to trust and to be and to maintain attachment to, to, to others. And the cure, if you want to call it that, the way out of that is to find a way to metabolize that horror and that grief and that loss of trust and find a way back with scars, <laughs> with pain, but to find a way back because if we lose the ability to connect we're dead. And that has happened to a lot of people either through just suicide or through walking dead. The, the treatment of choice is to get together, is to form relationships with a therapist or with groups of people who have undergone the same thing and to talk it through and to grieve and mourn and to grow together. The counterindicated treatment is to do what the Jews did with Zionism, which is to, I mean, take a look at Israel today. Ian Pape calls it Fortress Israel. Surround, build walls around yourself, post soldiers on the wall, and articulate a theology and to, and to teach your children, teach it well to your children, which is, it's dangerous out there. Look what they did to us. Trust no one, we will keep you safe. That's Israel. Yeah. And it's a, it, it, it's a, you know, it's a poster case for what humanity does uh, in, in general. And so that's why the idea of Zionism in Israel has been so attractive to the white Christian world. And, and you know, I can show you church, churches in Africa of black people who hold to the same thing. They've been schooled in this same theology. Right? So again, whiteness does not mean, does not only apply to color of your skin. And, and, and the Korean Presbyterian churches, well, so conservative theologically. So again, whiteness is capital W. Um, that's why it's so attractive. That's why the United States, which is, we're finding um, is fully um, em embracing its settler colonial DNA, right? Loves Israel so much. It's us. <laughs> that's what, that's the hammer that has to be taken to that hard kernel. And that's why when I read about what has been done to Bonhoeffer 
and the stretching and the twisting and turning and the distortion of who he was and where he was going and what his example shows us. That's why it, you know, that's why I lit a fire under me and had to write this 7,000 word paper, you know, and there's more to do about that. I added this question at the very end uh, because I really wanted to, I wanted to get your thoughts, but uh, our, our friend Marla Schrader uh, asks it uh, even better. So I'll just read what she asks, Mark. Uh, what are your thoughts on German church interference on the statement about Israeli apartheid at the recent uh, World Council of Churches Assembly? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Marla. I just glanced at that too. It jumped out at me. I mean, that's... Um... Uh, it, it, it connects, right? I mean, it connects with all of this. Oh, yes. And I just wrote about that. Uh, if, you, if you got the Kairos USA um, uh, newsletter, um, and if, if, if you didn't, um, just shoot me an email. Uh, Mike, you can put my email in the chat, uh, and I'll put you on the list and send it to you, because the WCC's just met. The WCC is a wonderful example of church struggle, right? It's done pretty well in the past uh, on dealing with racism and uh, taking care of uh, people in the world who are lying in the ditch. Um, but it also strives to be an ecumenical organization. And it's true to its legacy there, which is that it tries to keep people in the tent and to not, um, not create conflict. <clears throat> and often there's a north-south dynamic there. Almost always there's a north-south dynamic there. So the short story is um, that the South African Anglican Church submitted a resolution to the World Council of Churches that basically uh, said Israel's is apartheid and we have to do something about it. And it was, there wasn't, it was almost a dream that it would even get to the floor. Anyway, it went through the usual uh, the bureaucratic uh, um, the procedure that happens when something is submitted and went through a committee and the committee messed with it, right? But, um, and, and the German churches in particular, the German church in particular led the charge to say, this cannot be, you can't do this. And it found its way into the resulting resolution, which should not say that it did not say that Israel is apartheid, although it did a wonderful job of describing it perfectly, citing the uh, B'Tselem, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International studies. It did the whole thing. It was right there in black and white. And there's one paragraph which talks about, which mentions the A word, and it says, there are some who believe that apartheid is the right word to, um, to describe all the things that we've just enumerated. There are others who <laughs> object to this because it is uncomfortable, <coughs> uncomfortable and unhelpful. Notice, not wrong. Yeah. Painful. So, yeah, and your point. So it's painful and uncomfortable, you know, but it, it, it's apartheid. Says, and, then, and then they say, we are not of one mind in this matter. Now, that is a stunning statement. Because the World Council of Churches never says that. It comes up with some piece, you know, with some, where there's a lot of dissension, it comes up with some compromise, some, it makes some kind of oatmeal, and it presents it, that this is our voice. It has now said, we are of different minds, there are different voices. That to me is the huge total victory. That to me once, is one more step toward the beginning of the end of the church's defense of apartheid. And I will go back to the point I make over and over again, which is it's the churches that are gonna do this. It's the churches that, that, that were along with the end of the Cold War that were the last nail in the coffin of Af South African apartheid. And, um, the snowball is happening. The momentum is, is there. And I know, I know, I mean, I'm committing the same sin that I critique in the paper. You know, I'm saying, what would Bonhoeffer say? What would Bonhoeffer think? Um, 
But he would say, sure, of course. Of course, that's what we have to do. That's what we tried to do in 1935. We've been trying to do it ever since. I want to return to your central thesis, Mark, and turn the jewel just a, 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 a short way and look at it uh, one more time. Um, in the context of Bonhoeffer's discussion of cheap and costly grace, this is what you write. The post-Holocaust philo-Judaic position locates Christians in the comfortable space of God's continuing covenant with Israel, thereby affirming the notion of specialness and privilege and reassuring Christians of their own standing as the elect. It does not demand an examination of the fundamental sin that manifested in Jew hatred. It only requires the beseeching of forgiveness from the victim. And then you add the punchline, everything can remain as it was before. Now you've talked about this in the, in this interview already, but now in the context of Bonhoeffer's cheap and costly grace, say a word about this. Okay. Yeah. And the punchline is not mine. It's Bonhoeffer's. That's, that's, a ah. direct, that's a direct quote from, from, um, from discipleship. Okay. So this is cool because this is a peer to peer reviewed paper. And by the way, the fact that it came out in Theology Today, which is published by, Chris, by um, Princeton Seminary, I think is huge. It's wonderful. That's why, and I, I actually want to plug this with people or make a request to people. That's why um, I'm looking for places to really talk about this and have conversations about this with the people who it's addressed to, who, uh, who I hope to disturb, because Princeton Seminary accepted this paper. Now, Princeton Seminary, as a progressive Protestant seminary, <clears throat> like the rest of them, is a bastion of liberal Zionism. Yeah. Right? So they publish this paper. It's not a kosher paper, but they publish it. <laughs> it turns out that the, that the, that the, the new editor is, is a friend of our movement and a friend of Walter Brueggemann, uh, who I think put in a word for me, which is nice. But the fact that that happened is cool. Anyway, so it's a peer reviewed paper and the, uh, the editor got a terrific uh, reviewer for me. I have suspicions about who it is. Now, obviously a Bonhoeffer scholar. And he challenged me in a few things and made it a better paper. The first challenge was you talk about all these German post Holocaust theologians who are so steeped in Zionism and exceptionalism and who talk about Jews as the chosen people and, uh, you know, the land promise and all of this, and that they are, you know, they, they, how is this possible? They couldn't all be of the same mind, you know? It couldn't be that bad. <laughs> so I went, and they, they gave me a few names that I had heard of, but I hadn't, hadn't used, so I went back. And what I came up with was it was worse than I thought. So there's a whole section in there about Mar uh, Mark Vont, and, um, and others, it's, un as Naeem Atik would say, it's unbelievable, right? How extreme the exceptionalism is and the particularity is and how deeply embedded it is. And it just, you know, after, after the war, it's, this stuff just bubbled up in pure form. And, and, and it turns out that that's what you studied in seminary, right? And, and many others here, I'm sure. That was one. The second was, I said, these theologians have given us a cheap Bonhoeffer. Mm -hmm. right? And to his credit, he said, or she, I think it's a guy, because I think I know who it is, said, wait a minute, you're gonna throw, away, throw around cheap grace and cheap and, and, and costly grace. Everybody does it. Everybody uses and abuses Bonhoeffer to their own purposes and saying, this is cheap and this is costly and this is what you should do and this is what you should avoid. You can't get away with this. You show me how what you're talking about is an example of cheap grace. So I dutifully went back to discipleship, which we all need to do. You know, it's like reading Moby Dick or going back to Shakespeare. You gotta go back and read discipleship periodically, every couple of years, to see how, how it speaks to you in a new way. And this is in the very, very first paragraph, I think. It's something I hadn't seen before. He said, 
what's, what's cheap about cheap grace, he said. What it's about is that you're putting first and foremost the preservation of the status quo and the institutional beliefs and the creeds that you have come to treasure and you're not challenging them even though if you continue to do what you've been doing in the face of whatever historical challenge is facing you, you're gonna to have to take a look at this because you're not with Jesus. Obviously it's straight from his own experience, he said. So what you do is you find a way, and the South African Kairos document does this beautifully, find a way to use the language and to twist the words so that it, you can continue to do what you've done before, which basically means the people on top stay on top, the people on the bottom stay on the bottom, and we get to maintain our sense of arrogance and superiority and holiness. Okay, he says, and then he says, everything can remain as it was before. And that just jumped out. Wow. Yeah, please continue. Uh, it jumped out at me too. Yeah, that's what, and that, I, I mean, I thought that that was amazing. And it's probably the most, besides the fact that I'm knocking over idols and holy, you know, holy cows as I go, that to me, I, I, in a way, that's what I'm most proud of in this paper because I think that's a unique way to, 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 to um, that was the most unique contribution I make in the paper is to take another look at discipleship because Bonhoeffer was saying, not you have to be good to these people or you have to oppose tyranny. He was making a direct critique about the modus operandi of his own church and his own people saying, what you want to do most of all is not change and keep things the way they are because that's you want to remain comfortable. That's what's cheap and costly. Go back to Jesus again. Costly means take your hand off the plow, you know, resign your position as a tax collector <laughs> and follow me. And that's, by the way, uh, that's, that's what discipleship is in German. It means following. That's what discipleship means. Follow me. Leave your family, leave your job, follow me. Leave your country, follow me. That was the most powerful part of the paper for me too, when you reconnected it with cheap and costly grace. And I, it's good to know that uh, uh, the reviewer sent you back to discipleship, cost of discipleship to, to really flesh that out yeah. more fully. I just have a couple more questions for you, Mark. Uh, um, the prescription you suggest begins with not ignoring the evidence of the dark side of the Jewish position and recognizing for Jews and Christians alike, this is a time of Kairos. And then you say, and it's very poignant, Mark, quote, we have passed from the post-Holocaust into the post-Nakba era. What are the implications of that for both Jewish and Christian theology? Yeah, you know, when I came up with that formulation, it was not, it was only a few years ago. I said, ah, oh, this is good. This, this, this is important. <laughs> right? Because I certainly was raised in it, and I think we are still, both as Christians and Jews, um, living in, 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 in the, the, uh, the post Holocaust era, we're still struggling with what it's meant to us to have witnessed that catastrophe. For Jews, it's meant that our identity, and this goes back millennia, our identity is based on our victimhood. What it was that has been done to us, you know, in Passover, we repeat this phrase over and over again, you know, because Passover is about liberation from Egypt and uh, from slavery. Um, in every age, a tyrant rises up to annihilate us, but God, you know, God saves us. Uh, we are saved by God's hand. That's the dark side of Jewish identity, right? I mean, I love my Jewishness. But that's the dark side and it's in the DNA and it's in the cells and it leads to all kinds of bad things. Um, and for Christians, it's about the, as you point out, it's about the guilt and about being able to use that guilt to make an end run around 
what needs to be confronted about Christian identity and the dark side of Christian identity, which leads to all kinds of bad things. Okay, and so what I say to the Jews is, it's time for us to realize that our story today is not what was done to us, but what, what we are now doing to others. I'm not sure, I'll leave it to Christians to say what our story today is, as opposed to you know, what, we've always, what we've always believed. But I think it has something to do with, the most important thing is not keeping our house standing um, and inhabiting a house at all but letting go of that and realizing what we're really supposed to be doing in this world. I want to I want to build on that answer, Mark, and follow up uh, with uh, another question. You're one of the uh, American leaders of Global Kairos for Justice Coalition and uh, Kairos Palestine as the executive director of Kairos USA. There and your point is that theology matters. Uh, theology reflects, it legitimates, it even dictates uh, uh, politics and policy. So you hint at the end, Mark, uh, at a sequel, uh, what this might mean for the church in the world. And so let me quote from you again at the end of your paper. The message to Christians is this. If Christ truly is Lord, then he requires that we as he did on that Sunday in Jerusalem, stand before today's temples of empire, the governments and systems that steal land and despoil creation, that impoverish the many to enrich the few, that we demand, as that bold and radically reforming Jew did on that day, that we not rest until not one stone is left upon another. You've hinted at this before, right? You talked about it. So anticipate for us, your sequel to this paper, Mark, uh, what does this look like in the real life for the church, for individual churches, and for individual Christians as we're citizens in the world, in the world, but not of the world? Okay. Yeah, as you were speaking, I remembered, I had in the back of my mind something that I wanted to, the last point I wanted to make about the last question, but it really leads to your question. If we go from post-Holocaust to post-Nakba, you know, one, you could say, well, what's the difference? Uh, you know, Nakba is the Palestinians word for Holocaust or catastrophe. And I would, I would submit that it is a risk for Palestinians. What are Palestinians like, what happened to the Jews suddenly become empowered? <laughs> what are they gonna do, right? Yeah. Um, because just like I don't have Jews on a pedestal, we have to make sure not to have Palestinians on a pedestal, they're people except that they're brown and except, you know, the, again, brown is not a skin color, but, you know. And in, our, in today's world, we, as Jesus said, we, and as Howard Thurman said, we have to be focused on the, those with their backs against the wall. So the shift is, and what post-Holocaust versus post-Nakba means the shift is to a focus not on ourselves, but on the other. So the Nakba for the world today has to do with, again, going back to the, good, to the, to, to, to the, um, uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Who are you focused on? Who is our neighbor? And of course, you know, it, it, it's us. We have to step out of our own little circle and, in, and into the world, which has been my own journey as a Jew, stepping out of my ghetto and into the world. So there's also, you know, Naima Tik would always get in trouble because he would talk about uh, the Palestinians are, 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 are Jesus on the cross, right? And people say, aha, see, he is anti-Semitic. It's the, 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 the Jews are killing the Jews are killing God again, right? Which of course, I missed the point completely. But when you go back to that, to that uh, final paragraph that you quoted, where I said, if, to Christians, if Jesus, if Jesus really is Lord. Now, um, it's, it's, it's an audacious thing for a Jew to say, to preach to Christians, you know, uh, do you really believe that Jesus is Lord? I mean, who's this 
Who's this Jew who's doing that? But because Jesus as Lord is not about Christianity. It's not about a religion, right? What is the Lordship of Christ? What is the Lordship of Christ? And if you really want the answer to that, and that's who of my mind, read John DeGrucci's chapter. Uh, and again, send me an email and, and I'll, I'll send you the reference to this book because it's an amazing book. The Lordship of Christ is all about the theology of the cross, right? What does the cross mean? It doesn't mean that this man or God, holy divine or holy human, whoever Jesus was and is, sacrificed himself for our sins and all of that atonement theology nonsense, right? It's about humanity on the cross. It's about what we do to ourselves. And that has to be, that's what the cross means. That has to be in the forefront and the focus of our sensibility and our own identity as individuals and as members of whatever group we belong to. It's the cross. It's suffering and how we cause it and how we respond to it, and opening our eyes to that every day, like the women did at the foot of the cross and the men didn't, right? I'm gonna let Mark have the last word, and maybe uh, um, Mark, you wanna bring us back to Bonhoeffer when you have the last word. Sure. Um, actually, one thing which has been on my mind is some of you may have noticed that there seem to be two Mark Bravermans uh, present. The other Mark Braverman is actually my brother, and his name isn't Mark, it's Daniel. So I just want to acknowledge, I'm not quite sure why he put Mark Braverman in his uh, <laughs> ID, but I, I, I want to welcome him and, uh, and acknowledge uh, uh, his presence. Um, and again, thank the Indiana uh, Center for Middle East Peace and all of you for for being part of this conversation. And please do, did, did you put my email in the- I, I did. Uh, you know, okay. I, let me just say markbraverman48 at uh, gmail.com. It's easy to remember, Mark Braverman, 48 is the year I was born. It was a big year for lots of reasons, not just the fact that I was born. <laughs> um, and I will, um, you know, I'll send you, um, you can ask me for, uh, anything you want, including John DeGrucci's book and, and other references. Um, I guess what I'm gonna end with is, um, for all of us here, is that we need to remember, and I don't think I have to remind you, that this is a lot bigger than Palestine. Why does Palestine matter is the question that I ask you. Why does it matter? Right? It matters, of course, for the sake of the Palestinians, and for the sake of the Jews of Israel who are uh, in their own way, and maybe in a more profound way, spiritual and psychological way, the, the victims and the prisoners of this horrible system. Um, so it, obviously Palestine matters, but it, it matters also because if anything's gonna get the attention of world churches, it's this issue. And one thing that was on evidence on display at the World, at the world Council of Churches, and I just spoke to Rafat Kassis about it, who was there. He said, the solidarity behind us was incredible. Amazing how much solidarity we have. And of course, that's true. So, um, but Palestine is a, is, is a threshold. It's an entry point to the, the critical, and I mean that really radically critical issues that are facing the world today. And um, I will stick with my story that of course the governments of the world are utterly failing to help at all. And in fact, are part of the problem. But the churches have done it before and the churches can do it again to be the conscience of the world and to bring the world to its senses. Uh, I'm not saying that the churches can stop climate change, but in terms of quality of life and the kind of 
dignified, integral lives that we need to be leading. Um, I, I think the church is the answer. And inshallah, we will get beyond these boundaries of church, synagogue, mosque, etc., and form these co- and form these coalitions. So we need to keep up. We need to keep our work going. We need to keep our work going now more than ever before. As you continue to remind us, Mark, we need to we need to channel our church our church resolutions into congregations and among. Uh, Christians in their various walks of life, and we also need to connect it, be connected to the global church. Mike, can I can I make a, a, a quick please? request? You know, get back to the global church. Please, please. Uh, will you be able to? Can you save the chat? Because I would love to be able to read what was going on. Uh, absolutely, okay. absolutely. I plan to do that and send it to you. Okay. And the global church thing is really, really important. Global, you know, Congress USA is one spoken the wheel to use a bon hopperian um, <laughs> of, of, uh, of, the, of the global church. And the most exciting thing that has happened since the 2009 publication of the Kairos document is the creation of Global Kairos for Justice, which is a well-run, well-organized network of churches throughout the world that, uh, you know, the hub is Palestine, but all the spokes are churches and communities, local, national, ecumenical, throughout the entire world. So we have to remember that we are part of a, of a global community. If you subscribe to the Kairos USA newsletter, that's really, I, I don't, it's not branded as Kairos USA. It's branded as celebrating our global community. And, and that really is, that really is the key. Mark, you're a dear friend, and you're a friend, good friend of Indiana Center for Middle East Peace. I want to thank you uh, for uh, uh, entering into this conversation. You can see from so many of the comments in the chat room how appreciative uh, our listeners have been for your insights today. And thank you all for joining us today.